Hey guys, how's it going? It is Alex Williamson here with The Secret uh, History, living in your aquarium. So how about that? How is everyone doing in here? Looks like we've got a few folks already in here. You know how I roll. I usually set it for 4.35 uh, and roll in around 4.40 just because I know how YouTube doesn't alert anyone until five minutes after the fact. But I hope everybody's doing well. I see Kelly Huff, Kevin Rosenberg, Screaming Fly uh, <laughs> uh, Productions, who says, uh, Aquarium support, are we talking about tank stands tonight? Laughing till I'm crying emoji. Uh, sure, we can do that. We can talk about whatever you guys want. Today is another whatever you want uh, stream. And I figured I'd do these as the live streams uh, more lately because, you know, Honestly, I've been doing a lot of research deep dive type videos and I've been spending 30 or 40 hours a week doing research and looking up stuff on video and I figured, uh, hey, what the heck, let's, let's basically answer questions and, and troubleshoot, answer comments, talk about what's new in the fish room, that kind of stuff, rather than um, just giving you guys another lecture or spiel and then that way you guys can pick and choose and and if you're, you happen to be live, then maybe I can kind of help with more question answering. And uh, I may not have the answer, but I bet someone in the chat will, uh, if that is, <laughs> is the case. So uh, Collaborations of Curiosities also here. Uh, Euro uh, Gupper, uh, Jimmy P, what's going on? Hope you're doing well. Brooklyn Bell, what's going on? Leah Jett, David Rayner, uh, Craig uh, Doniger, Craig's Catfish Cave. Uh, let's see here. The 186 Element, uh, Lacey Finn, Skeddy Nana, <laughs> Jeff Kane, and uh, Kenny, what's going on? Or maybe it's Danny, but I, oh, it's, it's definitely Kenny. What up, fish tank people? <laughs> And we got Brian. How's it going, Brian? I hope you were doing well, buddy. Uh, 3G, good to see you. Lisa Sparkman, Brandon Davo, and Amy Lou, your average fish keeper, Lisa P. Kind of round out who's here for the start. So as others come in, I may say hi, but we got that out of the way. So how is everybody doing? Um, you want to know, uh, Lisa says, I want to know how all your rice fish are doing. Uh, I'm, a, I'm so obsessed right now. I have bad news for you. You know, rice fish only live two or three years. I've got this weird hair that I just realized I parted uh, to the wrong side. It's just going to be a pet peeve if I didn't fix it. Uh, put my headphones on. I think it grabbed it. But, uh, yeah, so basically... Um, they live only one or two years usually, uh, sometimes three, but mine, most of them honestly have died. I haven't re-upped. Uh, and then what happened during the uh, last year was I had um, a heat wave. It was 115 degrees here and it just, it made it so none of them had babies. And then in the winter they didn't have babies. So I have a few, I've got some red caps still and I've got a few um, Yohiki, Yohiki, um, uh, which are kind of like a mixed orangey kind of color. Uh, but other than that, I, uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of rice fish, unfortunately, and I am searching for them, but they're like 10 or 15 bucks a piece this year. Whereas last year they were, you know, five to 12, somewhere in there, depending on how nice of one you wanted. So they've definitely gotten more popular. They've definitely gone up in price. And if you're thinking about breeding this summer, I would consider those. And there are a lot more. Um, there are a lot more rice fish this year too. I've noticed uh, even local stores have like long fin and black fin uh, or black lame, like the black and sparkly ones. Uh, your average fish keeper, you have some uh, rice fish. I will gladly pay you for some, man. Uh, I'd appreciate that, buddy. Um, yeah, because I don't have much to go off this year. I was gonna kind of just make a Skittles tank of mixed different different species. Uh, I do have um, some shrimp tanks I'm setting back up though, and hopefully we'll have better luck. I've got, um, I've got some more wild strains of shrimp that I recently got. I have an unboxing video that's edited and filmed and everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, I'm up against the aquarium co-op tonight, huh? Well, 
I feel like I've been doing Tuesdays for a year. Every time I change, Corey ends up on the same night. So I just gave up. I'm not changing anymore. I'm just, I, I am who I am. I am when I am. I don't know. It might be a, a members only stream for him. I'm not sure. Cause usually he was going Wednesdays for a long time. So I don't know, but uh, I guess I'll compete with the big boys uh, and, and just get trampled. <laughs> no. Um, Patrick Hardy wants to know if it's okay to have uh, CPDs in hard water. And that's kind of a weird question because uh, the answer is mm, kind of, uh, they don't want a high pH, but they can have a high TDS. So they can have a, a total dissolved solids, a, um, uh, oh, awesome, your average fish keeper. You've got the all blacks, the ohiki, and the red caps. I will buy some, please, now. No. Uh, uh, yeah, please uh, hit me up or or I can hit you up uh, either way. But that would be rad, dude. Because uh, I, uh, yeah, or I can trade you something I have too happily. Um, let's see here. So, uh, yeah, they can live in hard water because where they live in, uh, in uh, Lake Inlay and the Shan River Basin, it's actually hard water. It, it's it's TDS is from is high from limestone. There's quite a bit of calcium and carbonates in the water, um, as well as leaf debris, which then makes the water acidic. So it kind of equals out. So you can have hot hard water, but you want closer to neutral. Like I think they can take around 7.4, 7.5. A lot of them are bred in captivity anyways now, um, but ideally they want more neutral water and they want a little bit of TDS. Um, they're okay without that TDS, but they're used to it. So they thrive best with a bit of hardness to the water. Uh, Brandon uh, says, Alex, trying to breed uh, pygmy quarries and autos in the same tank. Good idea. Um, autos are a lot harder to breed. Um, I would guess you'll have luck with the quarries. They're pretty straightforward. You just need to do a... Uh, a uh, um what do you call it i guess kind of a fake dry season and wet season change so you can let the tank evaporate a little bit turn the heat up to like 82 84 and then you'll put in water that's like 74 degrees uh and drop that temperature do like a 50 percent water change and fill the tank back up whatever's evaporated in a month and they should just have babies like crazy on the glass with a, a low TDS, um, neutral to slightly acidic water change. Uh, usually that puts them in the mood. Now, the autos, a lot of times they need a big group. They need like five, ten or more. And they will reproduce from the same thing. But I think that's a good idea if you're trying to breed them. Corys, they may eat the babies. Um and the eggs but if you're watching closely and the quarry spawn they'll put out hormones that may also spark the spawn of the uh the autos because uh that's a trick they use in in the farms is uh in asia a lot of times they'll actually put uh estrogen and testosterone in the water and that'll spark uh the the spawning of the autos um otherwise they're wild caught so uh, Lisa B says, I'm in Canada. I have some coming for seven bucks each and it's 65 for shipping. I, yeah, I know. So it puts that price right back up there at, you know, whatever, 15 bucks or 10 bucks each, you know, uh, it's a bummer. Amy Lou, what's going on? Uh, the secret history living in your aquarium. I have six blue daisies, rice fish. You can have moving soon. Will you be, uh, down at uh, G Pass in April or May. Um, you know, that's really kind of you. Thank you. Um, I probably will be down there, but honestly, I probably won't be doing daisies outside because they need warmer water, uh, and we just don't have that up here. In Cali, they can do it. In Texas, Florida. Um, but that's a really sweet offer. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let's see here. So, Laura Sutton. Hello. Uh, Michael Cyberling, uh, or, or Cyberling, <laughs> Cyberling, uh, what's going on? Uh, good to see you as well. And Ruben O, black rice fish or CPDs? I'd do black rice fish if you want to make more money quicker. 
Uh, CPDs, uh, if you've got a system down, you can crank out quite a few, but you kind of need to build up the numbers. Like you have 20 CPDs and a breeding tank, you can move all those adults over, put them in the breeding tank with big old round rocks or marbles, let them spawn their eggs for two or three days after feeding them lots of live high protein food and ideally separating the males and females for two weeks each time. If you get that down, I've done it in the past where I was breeding like 50 every two to four weeks with the group that I had. Um, they're pretty quick turnaround that way. And then I was using um, RU2 or, or um, also known as uh, the Pseudomagil uh, Gilbert eyes uh, from the RU islands that uh, um, Gary Lang collected. I was doing those in the top water. Uh, of another tank and then keeping the fry together with them and, and they had the same parameters doing did well and I got like at the time it was like six bucks for each of the fish but uh, retail so I was getting like two bucks each wholesale but selling them locally for five bucks a pop all day long to uh, friends in the hobby um, the WAP genius what's up welcome uh, our sunrise uh, hyphen platies uh, good for summer tubbing. They are depending on where you're at. If you're somewhere where it gets uh, pretty warm, they're pretty good. Um, in Seattle, they would work for probably like June through early September. Uh, and if that's enough for you, then that's great. I mean, just putting your fish outside for a few months is going to give them an incredible color tan. Um, yes, I said tan. Uh, the guanine and the omega-3s and omega-6s that they get from mosquito larva and uh, algae and green water and Daphne and all the other little stuff that gets in there, uh, it always really helps their color. Um, I mean, it's just not in our aquariums usually. Uh, so, I mean, I'd say give it a go depending on where you live. It just may not be more than four months or three months uh, if you're up in the northeast or northwest. Uh Brooklyn Bell, Alex, is it likely that one would be able to breed guppies and pygmy corridors in the same tank? It sure is. I have done that before. People have told me that's not going to work because the the uh, the guppies want hard water. Well, the truth is most guppies are bred in captivity. Uh, obviously, all of them now are bred in captivity. The last wild-caught batch of true uh, Pocilia reticulatus was probably in uh, 2003 or four, according to David Resnick, who's the foremost expert in the world on them. Uh, there are plenty living in the wild that are feral that were released 50 or 100 years ago all over South America and the Caribbean that get collected, but those aren't the same as the wild strain that are wild pattern like uh, endlers and so forth. Um, which are also still in existence, but getting much, much harder to find. Uh, Garden of Eater, what's up, man? I was just filming uh, an in-depth video on your shrimp. I was feeding some pollen granules from Aquatic Arts to them uh, that, that go down and then they get bubbles on them and they shoot back up to the top and the raccoon shrimp and the, uh, the beautiful uh, stardust shrimp were totally holding on to them, trying to like keep them from going back up and then they'd give up and then they break apart and come back down. So it was pretty cool to see. So I filmed them and did a rundown on all their, uh, their taxon taxonomical history. And, uh, you know, the fact that they're a wild Cantonensis version that was kind of overlooked. And now they've done the DNA testing and they've figured out that. And, uh, long story short, if you guys are wondering, um, I can, I can, uh, hold on, let me pull up another screen real quick and we'll look at those shrimp because the sun is shining on them. And they are freaking gorgeous. So I just let's do an interlude of that, and then uh, and then we'll go back to answering questions. But these guys are really pretty. And since Grant sent me them, he just just charged me shipping and said he'd send me some coals and just a selection of what he had. And I was just, I mean, that was very kind of him. And so I definitely want to give him a shout out. He has like fifty lines of shrimp, incredible stuff. Sweet shot, welcome as a new member. Thank you so much for joining. The membership it really does help um i noticed that like the um like the amount that google sends me for ads and stuff this like last month was incredible it was like 1500 bucks uh this month it's at like 900 
no idea why the viewing hours and numbers are the same, but those memberships really do help. So I really do appreciate it. You know, everybody chips in, uh, you know, two bucks. It really does help a ton. So thank you so much. Uh, let me get this up and running though. I'm busy yammering away, but the sunlight is on the tank right now and everybody's glowing. Uh, and they're all in kind of a quarantine tank right now uh, because of scuds and other stuff that I've had happen in the past. Grant's shrimp were impeccable. I probably should have just put them all in their own tanks and called it good, but I just wanted to sit and watch. And they're in there with uh, some Neo Caradina uh, that I already had that just can withstand anything. They're just always hanging out there. Um, all right, let's see here. Getting in, entering the studio. We're going to call this camera, camera one. Camera two, camera one, camera two. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, camera two. Okay, I need to turn down things a bit too. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go silent for a minute, guys. Silent waters, and then I'll be back uh, with a different view. With a different view on things. Uh, let's see here. Locked, ready, enter studio, boom. All right, can you guys hear me now? We're going on an expedition. So the sunlight is shining in beautifully, the, the glare if you get it at the right angle. But he sent me these beautiful tangerine tigers, and then he also sent me uh, some beautiful uh, raccoon tiger shrimp, which have those stripes. And then some stardust and cheetahs also, which are, if this would focus, let's see here. Can we get closer? Can we get closer? Oh, that's, that's more, that, that's not closer. That's worse. Sorry, guys. That, that's better. Okay. Um. Uh, So yeah, um, they're really pretty, especially in the sun. Let me get my hand out of the way. They've got like this iridescence, those, you know, the, the new video coming out on the raccoon shrimp will have all the details, but here's one that's pretty close. If we can get it to focus through the glass with dumb stream yard film, uh, even with a good camera, it doesn't want to focus. There we go. So pretty cool looking shrimp i like the wild cell better than i like the uh, tangerine tigers honestly but the tangerine tigers are more hardy of the caradina um fancy types so there's that now let me pull the stardust to the front or the cheetahs to the front because they're incredible in the sunlight um i'll just kind of startle them with some scissors uh jump back jump back jump back jump back get back Get back to where you once belong. Shrimpy, shrimpy, shrimp. He thought he was a fishy. All right. Hey, no. No. Jump back. All right, fine. You can hang out there. Uh, all right. So check these guys out. These are the cheetahs and the stardust. There's a combination of them. But they have beautiful iridescent blues and speckles which you'll see in their species profile i'm doing a species profile on both the uh tigers and the um raccoons so the raccoons some of them are black some of them are like a reddish hint almost in the sun which you can see only in the sun like that one behind it uh this one back here 
is red stripes when you see the sun on it. Uh, and, and that's probably where the tangerine colors came from. Whereas this has blue stripes when the sun's on it and you look real closely. So I'll be able to show that up close in the species profiles. But then we've got these beautiful iridescent with like oranges and purples and yellows, these cheetah shrimp. And then there's also um, some stardust, which are these ones that have little white dots all over that look very similar to the cheetahs. Here's, here's a better stardust. Um, let's see here. Look very similar to the cheetahs. They're all eating bee pollen right now. Uh, but a little more blue and more dots on them. More of these little white teeny tiny dots on them with an orange tail. And they're just beautiful. In the shadows, those ones actually stand out better, surprisingly. Diffuse natural uh, light. But And then we've also got in here a nice selection of my really and my uh, just some cherries that came from a fish tank that I wanted to sort of put in a, in a QT tank. So I set up the QT parameters for the, uh, for the raccoon shrimp. And check it out. This guy has orange eyes on the far right. So you know where the orange eyed blue tigers came from. Uh, definitely from him, his lineage. So... Yeah, they're all hanging out and eating. They're all doing really well. Uh, everybody's thriving and, and healthy. So I'm excited about that. I'm probably going to put the raccoons over into this uh, nano fish tank with the uh, with the phoenix and uh, chili rasboras and the somfongzi rasboras, all super teeny fish, uh, and let them do their thing. Uh, you know what's interesting is some fish laid eggs over here, and... Uh, the snails and algae got it like right away, but it's an, a weird mass of eggs and I don't know which fish are responsible for it, but that's kind of odd. All right. So I'll give one last look at these and then it's back to question time. But yeah, isn't that a beautiful setup? Thank you so much to Grant. Uh, if you want to check out these shrimp, you can go to uh, the garden of eater shrimps.com, but it's actually spelled out like T O E Wait, T G O E, uh, the Garden of Eater, his last name, shrimps.com. T G O E, shrimps.com. Uh, if you want to get, I mean, he's got so much stuff there. And then the uh, pollen granules, uh, I don't get a kickback from him or anything. He's just a real nice guy that sent me these shrimp. I do get a kickback for the food I'm feeding them, though. If you want to feed them these, these are pretty fun. Uh, and they have free shipping on all dried stuff. So, Secret History, all caps. Uh, this time, actually, it's History Secret 1-5. It's in the description below. If it changes, if that never like stops working for you, you can always look at my newest video, and it'll have what's up to date. But right now, it's still uh, History Secret 1-5, but they keep telling me they're going to change it again. So we'll see. All right, guys. So let me get back to uh, the computer so I can... Uh, answer all your questionables uh let me turn this light up too these guys need some light but uh let's see here also we'll just turn on all the tanks while i'm at it they, they've all they all get sunlight diffused all day up until now and uh this is another tank that you guys might be impressed by too um if he's out so the uh, Araguensis, uh, the Latiacara Araguensis that's in here. He's so pretty. He is out, but he's hiding in the back. But he's a real pretty fish when the when the light hits him. When the night has come. All right. I thought this would get brighter, but apparently flu ball light is not as bright as I had hoped for. All right. And then we'll turn on the biotope. Indonesian or Borneo tank, whatever you want to call it. And we'll turn on these guys too. Because the sun will be out of the picture soon enough. And uh, then, uh, yeah, see the sun. Oh, and also my magnolia tree out there is blooming with buds. And they're about to look incredible. So I'm excited about that. All right, let me set you guys down again for a sec. Let's switch back over and hopefully not deafen you like we did last time.
All right, is that okay? Are we doing okay? Can we feel okay? Can we be okay? I'm back. I'm okay if you're okay. Uh, all right, Brooklyn, let me get back to some of the questions. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> Brian, thank you. Uh, streamer of the day award. Ian, what's going on, brother? Good to see you. Um, okay, here we are. I'll, uh, oh, yeah, the pygmy Corridoras. Yeah, um, yeah, like I said, uh, breed for the quarries, and hopefully a group of autos will also spawn. Now, guppies with shrimp, that was the other question that we had, which is, um, you know, set it to the Neocaridina shrimp. So like neutral with a little bit of calcium, a little bit of GH and KH and, and uh, slightly acidic to neutral. And those guppies will do okay. Just don't put it on the low end of their acidic um, side or the guppies won't be okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Payne, what's up? Appreciate you, brother. Been binge watching your videos to get my uh, 10 gallon shrimp tank started recently. Keep up the good work and info. Well, thank you. Uh, I have some shrimp videos. Literally, they're all researched. I've been spending a week or so gathering info, and I talked to you uh, just uh, about bugs and stuff, but they knew about shrimp. So there's that. Uh, they were able to help sort me out with what's what, what's true and what's false and made up and not just in the world. Uh, Izzy G, welcome. Shane, welcome. Uh, Hertz, what's up? Uh, let's see here. I'll get down to where you guys are. Any tips for bleeding clown killifish? Not really other than give them a lot of floating uh, material, but the American Killifish Association probably has some tips and tricks that I don't know about. So you can apply to be a member, uh, and then they've got a lot of people. They'll even send you free killifish uh, eggs for joining. Uh, well, not free, but I mean, it's like 20 bucks to join or something. So they're pretty much free um, with the membership. Uh, what about breeding ghost shrimp and guppies in the same gown? Yeah, ghost shrimp can generally live in like any conditions you, you can think of. They live in Florida water where it's real hard. Uh, ghost shrimp are pretty easy. The only thing is um, ghost shrimp do, I believe, create larval offspring. Uh, so I, I think brackish is more ideal for them for their breeding uh i don't know i haven't bred ghost shrimp specifically and there's like 15 shrimp that people call crystal shrimp or ghost shrimp not crystal red or crystal black but they call them chris they used to call them crystal shrimp um so let's see here thingamatorium what's up hope you're doing well uh oh yeah aquahuna yeah we can't order from them in my state because um they sell to aquarium co-op as well as the wet spot and so Quarry made a deal to promote them, uh, but they don't sell to anybody in Washington since they're the wholesaler of a bunch of local stores in Washington. But they'll sell to you if you're out of state. Hey, Bjorn, thank you so much for the, the super sticker. Wow, I'm way behind. I'm just jumping up to live. I don't want to be asked answering questions that were asked forever ago if anybody left. Uh, let me uh, hop right up to where... Dr. Anthony Maserol hopped in, which reminds me, I'm going to sell something else other than the aquaticarts.com and the uh, Garden of Eater shrimp. I'm going to sell you guys to support uh, the Amazon Research Center. Uh, they are doing awesome work working on uh, teaching the natives to uh, the locals to, to get better at aquaculture whether that's for food and sustenance or for the aquaculture of the aquarium and ornamental fish specifically, that's really what they're set up for. But they teach them both in the process by doing so. And so you support them and for 50 bucks, you get a chance to get a flight anywhere in the world to Peru and a week staying with him at his facility. Super cool, um, super cool opportunity. And I mean, it's a good way to spend 50 bucks Feel good about yourself, help save the environment, help teach uh, Peruvian kids about uh, taking care of the, the forest. And he's got an aquarium down there with the local fish, which uh, good luck, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony, because there's what, like 800 species and 300 ornamental species right there in the river where you're at. So uh, have fun stocking that aquarium. That'll be 
a Goliath task, but they've got some cool tanks, like one, an overarching tank. And I bet for people in the middle of the Amazon jungle, that will be a real eye opener. Really cool. Um, Fish Brella Corporation pizza's on its way. I wish Rachel Beard. What's up? Aria. What's up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. There, he said, I, I know at least two sh ghost shrimps. There's like 15. Um, Basically, any shrimp that is a, a long nose, long rostrum with a crook back gets called that. That isn't colorful. Uh, oh. <clears throat> Heartburn. I swallowed that wrong. Sorry, guys. Oh, and I had... Uh, something else to show you there so graceful if you were thinking about forgetting <laughs> uh, my wife got me that shirt I just had to wear it Alex should I actually try to check out what's living around seagrass farms over here Oh, hell yes, dude. Uh, when I went there four years ago, there's a ditch to the east to the east of their building that, that has water in it sometimes, and it's a creek. And, uh, man, that is uh, unofficially, I don't want to, like, throw shade on them, but nothing has ever escaped into that creek. <clears throat> well, there's sure a lot of mollies and platies and guppies and... Uh, Corys uh, in there for that. And there's tegu lizards running everywhere around their place. Like if you want a tegu and you can catch one somehow, that's the fastest lizard I've ever seen. Those things were running straight up a corrugated metal wall, like somehow, I mean, like a gecko kind of thing at probably 40 miles an hour. I mean, so quick, so incredibly quick. Uh, 89 streaming and 89 likes. Well, right on. Thank you. You guys rock. Uh, Danny Weshi, what's going up? Lurking while I build a tank stand. Right on. Melissa L., hello also. Uh, so if you asked a question earlier and we missed it, I missed it. You guys didn't do anything. You guys have been good. I've been the bad one. Uh, just uh, let me know. Drop it down there and uh, do at Secret History or at Alex. Hopefully I'll see it. I'm missing some questions because I've got StreamYard up right now. I can pull up... Uh, I can pull up uh, the actual thing right now, too. So we'll see here. Do, 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 do. All right. So, yes, now, wait, no, still in top chat. Got to get to live chat. All right. So let's see here. Yeah. I want to go to Peru so badly too. I'm hopefully they draw they draw um, they draw the winner of the give of the trip to Peru uh, and all the details and stuff. Um, they they do that um, at the end of the month, the last day of the month, or maybe it's the first day of April. Or, but uh, the end of the month is the end of the contest, and I'm I'm hoping to buy another ticket because I I could only afford one went uh, at the beginning of the month, but. Yeah, I'm really, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, I've been looking for Malawas. Any recommendations for where to get them near the Midwest? Uh, honestly, Aquatic Arts was the only place that I found them online. Maybe Grant Eater knows where to get them if he's still in the chat. Uh, but Aquatic Arts was the only place I bought them from, uh, they're not a popular shrimp because they haven't been bred into a bunch of color forms, but they are like the hardiest and most sturdy, uh, sturdy shrimp that you'll ever have. I mean, I've cycled tanks with like dark green ammonia test tubes and they're fine in there. They're, they're way more hardy than neocaridinas even. It's crazy that they didn't become more popular like than Amanos. They also eat, a buttload of algae too, so that's great. Um, 
what type of shrimp would you recommend for a 10 gallon with pandagara? The Malawa shrimp are probably my favorite. Their their Latin name is like par para dentata, par para pence dentata, like real long name. Uh, three words. Uh, and and then it's a caradina on top of that. So the genus is caradina. But um, yeah, planaria, not bad in fish tanks, I would say. It can be a sign that something's bad. Uh, it, it just means that there's an abundance of bio material and stuff that's going to break down into uh, ammonia or nitrites or nitrates in your tank. So it means there's food particles or plant particles in your tank and planaria are one of the first things that shows up and starts eating that. If there is a flood of planaria, like you keep doing that, um, they can get to a level where there's literally hundreds of them and they can start taking down shrimp. I have a video called, uh, it's not a myth, planaria kill shrimp. And it's a video of a planaria eating a shrimp, like in real time. So they actually have a stomach midway in their in their body. It's not at their triangular head. It, it's midway in their body and they wrap around the critter and then they start nibbling at it. Um, and they can eat baby shrimp easily. And if there's a big enough group, they make a mucus ball like in a nest right under the substrate and they can get other things caught in there and then they'll all kind of swarm it and eat it. Uh, it's not pretty, but that, that being said, if you just don't feed your fish for a while, um, yeah, plenary can also take fry and when they do eat, eat your shrimp or whatever, they'll turn the color of those shrimp. So plenary that have eaten blue dream shrimp, they turn bright blue, yellow. If they, eat, you know, yellow shrimp, they turn bright yellow, kind of crazy. I can't find whisker shrimp to purchase online. Would you know by any chance an employee at PetSmart gave me some thinking they were ghosts until I did a little research and found out they weren't. Whisker shrimps. Are you talking about fan like bamboo shrimps? Google bamboo shrimps, boss. Lady. Well, we'll do. We can do that. We can do that as a team. Uh, uh, bamboo shrimps. Aquatic Arts usually has those too. I, I, Grant might also. Um, let's see here. Share. Extra screen, bamboo shrimp. Was this the one you were thinking about? Uh, these guys with the fans. Uh, wait, images. These guys with with the fan hands and the big long whiskers. Uh, is that what we were talking about? There's also, uh, I wouldn't assume it's this, but there's the other common shrimp in the hobby is a vampire shrimp. Other than that, it's all caradina and neocaradina and adiopsis. Um, yeah, they're just these big guys, but they do have good, some of them do have good sized whiskers. Uh, but they're kind of the Goliath beetle or tank of the shrimp, dwarf shrimp world. Um, all right, so... Um, let me know which one it is. Uh, it's not a filter feeder. Uh, so, uh, power to the smaller streamers. <laughs> Thanks, Bentley. Good to see you, man. So, by the way, if you didn't know, Bentley Pasco, right there in the chat, how it's spelled, uh, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y-P-A-S-C-O-E, -E. he has a, uh, he has uh, a YouTube channel, and he's a smart dude with uh, a lot of love for uh, plants and fish. And uh, he, you know how I am like a grandmaster horticulturist uh, three times over or four times over? He's like 11 or 12 or 13 times over now. Like, he set the record in our club. So he's a dude who's, who's grown a, a lot of uh, shrimp shrimp of the plants I got my mind on shrimp guys what's up mick how's it going uh check the fish box what's going on um all right let me see what did i miss anything else uh, while i was looking at the vampire can rust kill fish yes it could um 
probably not just the rust itself, but you just don't want that the sharp abrasive edges. Uh, it can lead to infections uh, like tetanus, which is actually from soil, but mold can have tetanus also. I, if you're really interested, because so many people told me, oh, there's nothing you can get sick from in, in your fish tank if you keep a clean fish tank. Not true. Not true. Not true. There's like a two-hour episode worth of stuff you can get sick from. It's not likely, but um, yeah. So, uh, oh, whisker shrimp uh, is an actual species of shrimp. Uh, oh, Lemarie. Okay, hold on. Or Lamarie. Um, let's pull that up. Shrimp Lamar. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, these are gonna be. Are these the Australian Yaba Yabas? Oh, hold on. No, these are the Napoleon. Okay, all right. Let me share this with you guys. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. All right. So, whisker shrimp. That's a new. Uh, that's a new term to me. Great picture. You can't see anything. Uh, I guess it camouflage as well. They're a prawn, and uh, light brown to clear with sometimes green pigmentation. Uh, Eight centimeters long, so they're pretty good size. Uh, rostrum, they have seven to nine teeth on the rostrum, uh, on top and bottom. Interesting. And uh, they're omnivorous. They eat algae, plankton. All right, let's look up some more photos of these guys that you can actually see because that picture is poo-poo. We're all learning today. See, I said, what can we learn today? I knew we'd learn something from people. Um, yeah, I'm not real familiar with this kind of shrimp, but clearly this, uh, this large, I see they've got the pinchers. Um, and the larger grouping, a lot of these have, uh, like the Yabas in, in Australia, they have, uh, like there's the Blue Claw one, the Rosenbergii, yeah, and... Um, some of them are orange, some of them are white, some of them are red. This one's blue and green. Um, so there, I guess there are a lot of species of these things. Uh, that one's pretty neat looking. I don't know if that's for sure one of them. Let's see. Does it say, uh, it doesn't look like that. This is one though. Um, so yeah, cool. Well, thanks for teaching me something. Oh, yeah, here's another good picture of a whisker shrimp. I guess I have seen those. Um, but, yeah, the native to uh, – the most common ones are native to Peru, it looks like. Uh, or, gosh, why do I keep screwing up things? Not Peru, uh, to Tibet. All right, now back to me. Me, me, me. Whoa, it's me. All right, let's see here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry that your uh, bamboo shrimp died, Holly. Uh, let's see here. So, secret history. I have uh, Bacopa salzmani in my high-tech setup, and it's not doing well. Melting. Any ideas? I suspect my water is too hard. Yep, that is exactly what I was going to say. It's probably that your water is too hard. Um Add some distilled water if you can. I mean, it's only usually 99 cents for like a gallon at like uh, Walgreens or CVS or something. I know that feels like a waste, but if you don't have an RO unit, you could get like, you know, the one or two gallon jugs for 99 cents and then uh, dump like five or 10 in a tank, even if it's a good size tank. Uh, and that will bring down your TDS somewhat as long as you siphon out water first uh, from the bottom of the tank. Stir it up as much as you can and siphon it. Um, uh, Dr. Anthony says, I just realized my membership lapsed here. Since I am in Peru, it wants me to pay in soles. Uh, the exchange is much cheaper to join in Peru. 
We'll do it when I get back to the States. Oh, uh, if it's cheaper in Peru, go ahead. They pay me the same no matter what. Oh, but if you want a super chat, then, then it, yeah, the, the, the transfer rate. If YouTube can screw you out of money uh, as a supporter, viewer, or as a creator, they will. They take 40% of the super chats right off the bat, and I'm annoyed by it because then as a freelancer, theoretically, if you're a YouTuber as a business, like which you have to be if you make more than 600 a year off of it in the United States, um, then you have to report it as a business, and it's a taxed in my state at 29% for a freelancer, just like if you're a freelance software engineer or whatever. So in 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 effect, you get taxed 40% at 3% by a credit card company, so 43% or whatever, and then you get it. So even like the, the fees of a channel membership, it's only a buck 99 to be on a member, but when they give me my monthly breakdown of that, I see that Basically, they take 40 cents of each dollar, so that takes me down to $1.20, and then I have to pay 30% tax on $1.20. So it ends up being like 80 cents I get for every $2 you guys spend. That's why people sending money on PayPal or whatever, you, you still are supposed to report the taxes and everything. But uh, yeah, if you guys ever give to charity, please do it that way. It's less important because I know people like to be social I give super chats on YouTube too, but I mean, I just can't say that enough. It, 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 I don't think people realize how much they take. Plus they run ads, which they're making more money than they give you on. Plus, you know, whatever. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. If you have any, um, any more questions, guys, I am, uh, I am ready for you. How long is too long for Plecos to trap? Wait, how long is too long for Plecos to trap? Anyone know? Trap? You mean like to be, uh, to, to have the female in the cave? Is that what you're talking about? I've seen them do it for two or three days. Um, but usually they will break it up and then the male will stay in that cave with the babies for up to a month. The male will actually starve to death before he comes out. And they wedge in there with their pectoral fins if the cage is if the cave is narrow enough to and they like a cave that is, especially uh, bristle nose. That's why you know you don't want bristle nose plecos to be mating as soon as the female's ready because if you feed a lot of protein, she'll be ready to mate with the male over and over like every four weeks, and the male will die of losing body weight after two or three times of that. Um, so yeah, will any fish eat planaria? Lots of fish will eat planaria. Most people say they don't, and it's because would you eat if somebody gave you like a, a whatever your favorite Chinese dinner or Mexican food, a taco, whatever, whatever your favorite you know food to eat is uh, that's not gourmet. But if someone offers you that every day, and then they're like, or you can have this uh, granola bar that doesn't taste like anything and has nothing that you like in it. Um, you're not going to eat the granola bar until you're starving. But if in the wild, they eat that kind of stuff all day long, that's what they're used to. And if you just don't feed them food for a while, they'll start hunting for that, most fish. And they'll start noticing, oh, I can eat that. And they'll eat algae, especially live bears. Live bears are notorious. Sword fins, mollies, um, platies, guppies. They'll eat planaria if you starve them. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. John crew. I have a pro Democrat Taiwan. What did you say? Uh, Taiwan paradise garami named blue tiger. He will be bred with a, uh, female fighter. Placot better. Well, you can't breed a garami with a female fighter fish. Is there a joke I'm missing? I mean, I could see maybe a mainland Chinese paradise fish and a Taiwanese uh, fish not getting along. Uh, that depends who you ask. Um, let's see here. There's L270 plecos. Uh, 
let's see. What did you say before that? Uh, yeah, they're stuck in the uh, scared that the male killed her. I had fry, and they're seven years old, so they're like family. They could be in there for a, a, like the male could be in there for a month. Honestly, um, you can pull them out if they're fry and it's been over. A, give them a, at least a week to hatch, and then the dad will try to keep the fry in there as little sticky heads as they're called so you can then shake them out and you know use water and just kind of forcefully do this i'm sure they don't like it but it doesn't seem to hurt them uh into a tank and um and uh yeah wait you say i'm already breeding one paradise garami fish with a female crown ta tail betta I don't believe it. I've never seen that. Is that a thing? I don't believe that. Um, maybe. Maybe it's the thing. Let me see. Beta Garami Hybrid. Uh... I mean, because oh, uh, other bettas can breed with each other. Wait. Breeding Garami with betta. No. Yeah, no. You can't. So. Unless you've got a, a case that is undocumented to science. Yeah, it's not in it's not in the uh, in the academic work either. I mean, it would surprise me because that's across way different than even genus lines. Um, I bet it's a wild betta that was sold to you as a paradise of some sort. That that's what I would assume, or vice versa, uh, a paradise fish variant that was sold to you as a wild betta variant, or you have something that we don't know about that is new to the hobby. In which case. Please send me pictures, if that's the case. Uh, I would love to see that. Uh, send them on the Facebook group so everyone can see. Um, let's see here. Alishan, what's up, brother? Uh, the biparental mouth breeders of Lake Tanganyika have an interesting strategy. Females will hold for a week or more, transfer to the male. Uh, the female can then recover and get ready to breed, and the male will be fine. Yeah, see, cichlids are cool. They they have all sorts of uh, clever, clever, clever little tricks they do. Uh, Susan from SLC Aquatics, hello. How are you, my dear? I hope you're doing well. Um, let's see here. Uh, Trentley Newman thinks that would be cool, too. I agree. Uh Oh, interesting. Lacey Finn says, I've heard of people trying betta with garami, but the fry die upon hatching, so maybe they're not viable. Um, yeah, the croaking garami are very similar in shape. But, uh, yeah, GRB says, I've never heard of them crossbreeding either. But still, John, if you got it, we would love to see a video or pictures and try to figure out what's going on. Sounds interesting. Uh, Daniel Kim says, yo, Alex, got a question. Got an ADA Amazonia tank with our low Seattle TDS water, best method to add calcium in your experience. Um, you know, the ADA stuff is buffered somewhat. So I don't know if you've tested it for the GH yet. Uh, it does have some GH in there. It's made from volcanic ash, which has like a limestone and silicate uh, matrix apparently from Japanese volcano. But, you know, what I would do you can add something like equilibrium or stability into the water, like something from Seachem that's like a, a buffer. But I actually like taking eggshells. I'll boil eggshells. If I have a hang on the back or a cartridge filter, I'll boil eggshells. I'll get that protein film on the inside off. And then I'll just crush them up so that they're, you know, little fragments. And I'll put that on the, on the coarsest layer of the sponge filter uh, in the filter and then whatever is um, whatever is on that eggshell uh, it breaks down the uh, calcium out of it so the bacteria then goes into 
the water as it dies each generation it goes drifts out into the water so slowly very slowly it releases calcium plus some of the calcium just dissolves as that gets broken down it's it's, it's kind of a nice way to do it but um you can use that or you could also use um cuddle bone um so yeah uh let's see here um let's see here viable question mark isn't that what they say uh isn't the offspring viable actually i got two guppy or two uh bettas that are doing the deed right now blowing their little bubbles and curling up with each other um uh, let's see here electrify crushed oyster shells or eggshells crushed yep that'll do it uh, thingamatorium have an old coffee grinder i crush up the eggshells and that works great hey thanks for the tip thingamatorium that's uh yeah that's a great way to do it uh lady rorschach good evening alex i have a question for anybody does anyone have experience with asian stone catfish yeah i do they, they're also called anchor catfish um specifically if they can handle slightly warmer waters of 78 to 75 and catopolis totally yep they can uh, withstand that. They go down into the Irrawaddy and the Ganges River all the time. Uh, Malbar also, I believe. Uh, they're found throughout the Indian subcontinent and up into the Himalayan foothills, but so are baddest. Um, they can withstand cooler waters and hill stream water, but they also get caught in like rice paddies that get baked in the summer after the wet season and whatnot, um, right before the, 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 yeah, the wet season starts. So there's that. Uh, Mick M. Yeah, is it Steenfot trolling? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Somebody trolled me as the king the other day, uh, but I knew it wasn't him because uh, they didn't speak dumb enough. Let me just put it that way. When it's him, I always know because he gives it away real easily if, if you have a iota of brain cells. A boss lady would like putting a mineral stone or stones inside a gallon of distilled water help. Uh, would like putting a mineral stone or st uh, stone. Yeah, you could put, um, you could also put limestone or siltstone in there. Any stone, if you have, um, I mean, you could get some humic acid or even strong vinegar. And if it bubbles on that stone, uh, it's going to be very alkaline, and you can then put it in an aquarium if it were neutral. Uh, the thing is, you can swing the pH if you don't have any carbonate buffer. So calcium is one part of the buffering, but you also want a carbonate buffer so that you don't swing your pH to the point that um, you kill fish. Because uh, you could send it from 7.0 distilled to 8.9 or something, and your fish wouldn't like that. Um, but if you put in, um, let's see here, let's see who just said, wow, you just violated him. Um, where, where did that come from? Uh, do, 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 I have, oh yeah, that got that already. Alex, my local fish store can now order wild uh, Hemi Eisen Nanensis uh, 45. Uh, are they rare? Um, I haven't seen them very often. Um, yeah, I haven't seen them a whole lot. Um, let me check real quick on a list I have of wholesalers. I can't show you guys, though. Um Build him, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, they're pretty cool fish. They're Thai fish. I'll show you everybody else in a minute here. Let me pull them up on Seriously Fish or something. They're like a real flat fish, but um, I think they get like, I don't know, like two inches or something. So they're pretty similar uh, to the chain loach or the Bonio spotted loach. Hold on. Here we go. Um, but they're, 
different in the their, their pattern is in this school uh, or like a butterfly loach or a reticulated loach um, it says the species may not have yet appeared in the aquarium hobby even but I have seen them before um, but that's interesting um, so and uh, the guy who found them helped find the panda loaches too which is kind of cool so let's let's just do a look on the internet real quick just to see if these guys are um, I mean the fact that there's so many pictures tells me that they are in the aquarium hobby obviously and that you can buy them in the UK um, yeah aquaimports.com has them uh, so yeah they're around but I wouldn't pay crazy money for them I mean they're they're an interesting novelty if you really like them but honestly I think that like the uh, Borneo um, loaches whether it be the blue spotted ones or the uh, striped ones or the butterfly ones I think these are way prettier and they're like 10 bucks or less usually um, maybe 12 bucks or less. So you've got the striped ones, you got the spotted ones with the blue tail, and then you've got the butterfly or reticulated, which are like, um, look like a little stingray more so. Um, then you've got the sucker loach, which, which is dotted with the green. So there's about five species in the hobby already. Um, and I think these other ones are a little bit cooler, plus they stay a little smaller. And they look like stingrays on the glass. So I would say I'd pass on that one probably. But if, if you have had a, a an aching in your heart for that, then, uh, then get them. That's what matters. Uh, so hold on. I want to show you guys. If you didn't watch fish news that I did this week, Fishery, uh, check out this dude. He scares me. He's like what haunts my dreams now. Look at that. Must have had some blue, blue eyes. Or uh, some really scary Rasputin, like glaucoma, crazy eyes or something. Uh, but in any case, this is James Rodaway. He is a uh, an ichthyologist uh, from America who has some fish named after him. And I was doing a story... Not on him, but on uh, Marion Durbin Ellis, uh, who named the Hemiogrammus Rodwayi after him, or the Gold Tetra. So there's that. Um, let's see here. But yeah, it was just his birthday not too long ago, too. All right, we're Xing out of that. Back to the questions. All right, uh, let's see here. Daniel Kim. By the way, I've been trying to bring some rainbow belly pipe fish in. That would be awesome. I talked to the wet spot and they replied that they're having trouble because of their origin is India and COVID's messing things up. Yes. Uh, that's why pea puffers were gone for like a year and a half from our area. Uh, definitely it, that, yeah, it does. It did mess everything up. Um, same with a Amazon puffers um, or not Amazon. Sorry. Uh, same with the, uh, the all the Indian puffers and the um, and the Congo puffers. Not because of that even necessarily, but because war has kind of broken out again in the Congo. It's never really stopped the civil war that's going there. The Hutu and the Tutsis on the border with uh, Rwanda and Sudan uh, being the other conflict. Let's see. Richard McCarthy, random question, but with plant ferts, do you usually dose exactly what the bottle recommends or overdose uh how much for your jungle tank uh i extra dose dailies but i do it every second day uh and those are very dilute already but like with um with anything like dustin's plant juice or uh, aquarium co-ops easy green i wouldn't overdose that unless you really know how to handle your algae blooms because it has nitrates in it. Most all-in-ones have a nitrate uh, rate that's pretty high. And that's why I don't use his is because I stock my tanks pretty heavily and I don't want uh, I don't want more nitrates in my tank. I've already got nitrogen in there. Um, 
Let's see, Brandon, do you know uh, what causes the soil uh, to buffer pH and a way to rejuvenate that buffering? Something with humic acid? No. So humic acid is actually what soil um, puts off. So as things break down, they make carbonic acid, nitric acid, humic acid, and sulfuric acid in, in very low amounts uh, because those are the elements that are present in them and they can ionize easily. But in any case, uh, they break down over time. They suck up and bond with all the things they're gonna bond with. And unless more layers are being deposited over them, and that's getting pressed under pressure and earth, like happens in a lake uh, sample core or stones that get made like siltstone, um, your soil is not replenishing itself with plants. Now, mulm eventually is a type of soil. It will, it, it's a fluffier type of soil, but over time it compresses and it replenishes that. If you're feeding your aquarium all the things like calcium and, um, you know, uh, and uh, I don't know, think of all the, the, the vitamins and minerals, zinc, manganese, magnesium, uh, potassium, all that stuff, all the things that plants and fish need. If your food has those things, it's not going to exit the tank, except when you trim plants, you're taking out stuff, but all that stuff falls and rots and stays in the tank other than basically oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, I guess, helium, um, and, uh, and carbon with, and sulfur, those can all evaporate somewhat off as gases, methane, I guess, too. Um, but the rest is going to stay in your aquarium. And for the most part, most of it stays in your aquarium. It's a confined space like Earth, um, <laughs> minus the stuff that's gone out through our ionosphere. Uh, but you can renew that buffering by adding KH and GH boosters to the water. So calcium and, uh, and, and carbon forms, but it, you don't want to just throw like active carbon in it, it's, it's a specific form. Uh, and, uh, the calcium, you're not going to do much harm by adding calcium. So eggs and like, um, uh, eggshells, uh, cuttlefish, uh, beaks, which are cuttle bones for parrots to chew on can break those up. Some people use, um, uh, uh, Tums for your stomach. Apparently, uh, if you get the non-flavored Tums, you can use antacids. Um, but really, you're kind of just playing with the water there, um, the water column more so. It will settle a bit, but you're not gonna you're not gonna reinstill those into the soil that well. There may be some bacterial uh, life forms or some fungal life forms that are able to. Um, basically hyper condense it uh, with their metabolism and maybe it'll get back into the soil uh, via like bioremediation, but probably not. Uh, probably not. Uh, uh, New Local Austin, uh, I saw that uh, your reports are on my favorite part of, oh, oh yeah, the Aquatic Morning Show. Yep, yep. If you're a member... Every day I have an episode on this channel for you. Uh, basically, I'm doing seven episodes a, a week. Uh, there's two live streams. There's usually two upload videos. And then there's four updates from the uh, academic world that of whatever's being published in all different journals that I can find having to do with aquaculture. And uh, if you're a member of the channel for a buck ninety nine, you get the sources, uh, like the source material, citations of any additional research I do, and you get all those videos early and they're in the community tab. But this month, you guys can get those for free. So just go to the community tab and you'll get Fishery, which is like three minute to eight minute stories, uh, four back to back. And then they get played on the Aquatic Morning Show. Also in the Main's Tale for in Finn's channel, Jess's channel. And, uh, but if you're a member, you can just watch them here too. Uh, so whatever floats your boat, but uh, I'm trying to to grind to, to make this uh, so I don't have to keep taking on a bunch of graphic design jobs and this and then spend 
60 hours a week working on stuff. I'd rather work on this 40 or 50 hours. Um, let's see here. Alex, I'm thinking of making my own root tabs. Can you suggest a brand of loose fertilizer? Maybe um, Osmocote. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I mean, you'd probably, you'd probably be cheapest just to buy those things that you need. Zinc, potassium, permanganate, or what, whatever it is. I don't know how it's going to be sold. Potassium in some form. Uh, potassium will blow up if you had it just pure. But... Uh, there's stable forms of it, organic forms of it. Um, in fact, in college, we had some potassium and uh, elemental. And uh, we, my friend got it from the, the chem lab. And it was covered in um, axle grease or uh, some sort of like oil stuff. And uh, we took it down to a lake and he kind of rubbed part of it off. And he was like shaking when he did it and he was drunk. And uh, real nervous. He's a chemistry major, organic chemistry major I lived with. And uh, he threw that little cube that was like this big in the in the lake that we were at for, what was it, 4th of July or something in the summer. And uh, it, it didn't do anything for a while. And then all of a sudden when water got to it, even the humidity in his breath could have set it off, I guess. But the water, it blew up like, I mean, it blew up like probably something way bigger than an M80. Um, pretty crazy stuff. Uh, yeah, Osmocote is probably what I would suggest unless you're going to do it element by element. Um, all right, let's see here. So I know Bentley does stream soon. Um, uh, let's see here. Electrofry asked, have you had any luck breeding any kind of loaches? So yes, I've, I've bred a few panda loaches accidentally. I mean, I was trying really hard, but I don't know what did it. Um, I never got them to breed in mass. I had about 12 of them. And then one day I looked and I had like 15 and two were the babies. And, you know, then I had another one six months later. Um, so never efficiently did I breed them. Uh, other than that, I've only bred kind of open water loaches like, um, um, like, uh, a yo-yo loach. Um, the Burmese border loach or multi-banded loach. I've bred those quite a few times. They just breed in this, this tank. That's, uh, this tank over here with all the, um, all the, uh, red root floaters on it. So there's that. So there's that. Um, all right. Well, uh, Indian puffers are at Aquatic Arts. Right on. Good to know. Uh, uh, that is good to know. Uh, what would it take to change a common name? For example, Metallic Tetra would be more accurate for the Golden Tetra. Yeah, no, I agree. What would it take? Um, talk to Seagrest. <laughs> Basically, it's whoever sells a lot of them starts calling them something else. You start calling them something else and you have any sway or your friends start calling them something else it'll start catching on. I mean, common names have absolutely no bearing in reality or science. So it, it's whatever's hot for brand for branding. A lot of times it's kind of on the spot. They come up with something because of, uh, you know, they're out there in the field and they notice some attribute of it and they're like, Oh, it's this, or the name of the guy who funded the expedition or whatever. And that can also sometimes inform the Latin name or Greek name. But usually it, it's just a branding thing like um, Cherry Barbs. That was just a name uh, that a New York Aquarium Society decided to call them in the 1800s. Um, and it stuck. But in other countries, there's different names. Like the Pea Puffer is the Indian Dwarf Puffer. It's also the Malbar Puffer. It's also the Dwarf Malbar Puffer. And then it's also the Spotted Indian Dwarf Puffer. Um, and then there's another one that looks just like it. Uh, basically, without any metallic around the eyes and no squiggles. It's just dots. Uh, so common names uh, vary, I mean, from country to country. And also, like, um, it may be that there is a common name for cherry barbs in Germany that is the German word for cherry. So whatever, I mean, if you want to call it a metallic tetra, no one will know what you're talking about unless you inform them of that. But um, I mean, start calling it that. I agree. Or, or like, uh, aluminum tetra. 
Um, all right, Brian, you have a good night too, buddy. I got to get off here pretty soon too. Carla um, says, remember to hit that like button. Right on, right on, right on. Um, I can answer one more question, but then I'm going to go because it's Bentley Pasco's time to roll. And I don't like rolling over channels that are smaller than mine or my size. Plus, he's a good friend of mine. So I'm going to get out of here around 6 o'clock my time, 9 o'clock East Coast. So thank you so much, guys, for the new member. I appreciate it. Uh, for the uh, super sticker, I think we had a 99 cent super sticker. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, most of all, thank you guys for being here, for asking questions, for hanging out, for, uh, for being uh, members of the channel, for being subscribers of the channel. It all means a lot to me. And uh, we're almost at 30,000 subs, which uh, I didn't think this nerdy ass channel would ever get there. So uh, thank you guys. It really does mean a lot to me um, when people share stuff and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, is there an aquarium uh, hybrid like flower horns that are small? Well, I mean, Crebensis are a really beautiful fish that gets hybridized with other um, collection points. And then there's things like um, the um, the various uh, Akara variants or the um, uh, Honduran red point variants, like the polar one that's mixed with the blood parrot. Um, there are some hybrids like that. Uh, there's also some of the Central American cichlids that get bigger that are hybridized, but honestly, um, the flower horns are quite unique in the way they've been created. Um, I used to not like them. Now I'm just kind of, um, I do think they're cool, but I don't like it when they're bred to the point where like their hump interferes with stuff. Um, but I, you know, I actually have a flower horn store and a guy who watches, who's a really nice guy, um, that wants to support my, um, my podcast. And that was the, hook, the, 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 um, the hang up on why I wasn't, why I, ha I don't have the podcast up was I said, can I in good conscience endorse this? If I don't keep these fish or don't know about these fish that much. And for a while, my answer was no, I got to find more sponsors. But um, at the same time, I, I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. And nobody's like, they're, they're not re-releasing -re them into the wild and stuff. And I do think they can be extremely pretty. I just have a problem with any like teacup platy or balloon molly or whatever, you know, any variety of fish, if its organs are being hurt or if its locomotion is being hurt. I don't like that. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I, I can definitely see why people like them. Um, so yeah, uh, lacy fins, enigmatochromus, uh, Lucan's eye, um, order them from the wet spot. They have them there. They're pretty cheap for what, how rare they are. Uh, and they have them there. Uh, you, I don't know if they guarantee a pair or not, but, uh, go to their website and a lot of times you can request that in the notes and they're pretty easy to tell apart male and female. So they, they, and usually the age they get them at that they'll be able to tell. Um, so you have pretty good chances. I'm going to get off right now. Uh, my wife's home. So that's my cue to leave and Bentley's rolling. So you guys, if you head over to Bentley Pasco's channel, uh, hashtag Alex sent me, let's do that. Uh, and, uh, maybe I'll see some of you over there and I hope you guys have a great night. Again, thank you, Replay Crew. Thank you, Lurkers. And thank all of you who are here right now. Uh, have a great day. Have a great night. Have a great morning. Whatever it is, wherever you are, have a great one. Talk to you guys later. Bye.